Science and politics don't play very well together. Sometimes it seems like there's an ocean between them, even though we would all agree that public policy ought to be based on the very best science available. But we know it doesn't happen. We can see it every day that it's not happening. And things got so bad that back on July 10th, 2012, scientists marched in the streets of our national capital to protest what they called the death of evidence. Scientists out of the labs and into the streets. So you know things must have gotten pretty bad. Now, it's easy to blame politicians for this, but what I want to talk to you about today is what scientists can do to try to bridge the divide between politics on one hand and science on the other. And you may be saying, well, who is this guy? What, what does he know about politics and science? My name is Graham Steele, and I teach here at Dalhousie University. But I haven't been here for very long, and I'm not a scientist. <clears throat> for 15 years be before I came to Dalhousie, I was in politics. And there's me in the Nova Scotia legislature delivering the provincial budget, $9 billion worth, the provincial budget for 2012 as Nova Scotia's finance minister. So during my time in politics, during my 15 years, I learned a lot about how politicians think. I know what's going on inside their head because I used to be one myself. And I can confirm that what's going on in most politicians' heads doesn't have a lot to do with science. And, and, and you might ask yourself, well, why not? What is the problem? What is it that keeps them so far apart? I think I can start to give you an answer to that question, but first I want to lay a foundation in three parts. And the first part is, that for the most part, politicians are not scientists. Nova Scotia has had an assembly for 260 years, since 1758. Guess how many PhD scientists from the natural sciences have served during those 260 years? I've looked, I know. The answer is one. There have been eight PhDs altogether, seven in the social sciences, but only one in 260 years in the natural sciences. So your politicians, your elected representatives, by and large, are not people with a science background. But that does not mean they are stupid or lazy or greedy or self-serving or any of those other stereotypes that you may have of politicians. In fact, being in politics is one of the most difficult jobs that you can imagine. You have to know a little bit about all the things that a modern government does. Provincially here in Canada, that means you have to know about health and education and transportation and infrastructure and justice and social services and environment and fisheries and agriculture and on and on it goes. And you have to balance all the many demands for public resources. Every issue that comes across your desk has eight sides, and you're expected to know all of them. Meanwhile, you're on the road to the capital city. You're sometimes away from your family for a long time. Meanwhile, you have to keep in touch with thousands of your citizens back home. And you have to do all of this in the glare of the media spotlight. It's a very difficult job, so politicians are not stupid. They just happen not to be scientists. And the third bit of the foundation is science can be fuzzier than we sometimes let on. It's very easy to say public policy should be based on the best evidence available. I mean, who would disagree with that? It's apple pie. But as Professor Alan Jacobs pointed out in his recent book, 
how to think, that view is naive. Because a lot of the time, the evidence is contradictory or inconclusive. And all that we're left with is muddling through, and the best we can hope for is to be honest about the fact that we're muddling through, and not to claim that the evidence is more clear than it actually is. Okay, so with that foundation, I want to talk now about the cultural difference between science and politics. This is philosopher of science Karl Popper, who pointed out, for example, that the scientific method can't prove anything. All it can do is falsify things. And so there is doubt and skepticism built right into the fabric of the scientific method. And then you add to that things like falsified data, or suppressed data, or opinions for sale, or publishing pressure, or the so-called file drawer effect. All the ways that good science can go bad. And so maybe it becomes a little bit more understandable that our politicians aren't always sure what the science is supposed to be telling them. And there are differences. Oh, so the foundation is politicians are not scientists, politicians are not, are not stupid, and science can be fuzzy. There is a difference between scientific culture and political culture. That fundamentally is the reason why the two seem to be sometimes an ocean apart, not even talking to each other. It's like two countries with an ocean between them, speaking a different language, with a different history, with a different way of understanding and looking at the world and speaking about the world. Let me give you a few examples. First, the approach to time. This is Arthur B. MacDonald. He's born in Nova Scotia, a graduate of Dalhousie University, and in 2015, he was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, Professor MacDonald had worked on his research into neutrinos for decades, and that culminated in some uh, papers that were published in 2001 and 2002, and it took 13 years for those seminal papers to be digested and analyzed and for the Nobel Prize to be awarded. And in scientific terms, that was fast. And meanwhile, Canada had had five elections and four prime ministers. So science and politics move at different speeds because in politics, the crises erupt now and you have to make decisions now and you have to deliver public services now and you have to win an election soon, if not now. So a different attitude towards time. Same with public opinion. Public opinion is at the core of politics and in a democracy, that's a good thing. Politicians have to keep in touch with where the public are because it is the people's government. And sometimes the politicians will be ahead, pulling public opinion along. More often they're being behind public opinion, trying hard to catch up. But public opinion and politicians are always doing a dance around each other. And that's just not part of scientific culture. Scientists don't go out in the street with a clipboard and say, what do you think the results of our research ought to be? You know, we could tell you what was in the lab, but what do you think it ought to be? It's just different cultures. Then there's the idea of perception, which is so important in politics, because you don't have to be in politics for very long before you realize that people vote based on what they believe to be true, not what is actually true. Perception is reality, is an idea that is soaked into the very fabric of our system of politics. And that's why your politicians spend most of the time trying to shape and control what you believe, 
whether it's true or not. And you can see right away how different that is from scientific culture. And finally, I'll mention negotiation. Negotiation, compromise, balancing competing interests is the very soul of politics. That's what politics is. That's what you do when you're a politician. There are limited social resources and you are allocating them in a way that the public can find acceptable. The authoritative allocation of scarce resources and you do it with negotiation and compromise and dealing and balancing with different interests. And again, that is not at all the way that good science is done. So there are some very significant differences between scientific and political culture. How can a scientist have more of an impact on public policy? Or another way of putting it is how can a scientist be a more effective citizen? I have spoken and written in other places about some techniques that citizens can use to have an impact on what it is their politicians are doing. And those techniques are just as available to scientists, although they may need to be adapted to the ways and means of science. Here's some suggestions. First of all, build relationships. Build relationships with the decision makers who are making decisions in your field of science so that they know who you are so that they will take your call, so that they might even call you first when they're making decisions in your field. And if you're not sure who the decision makers are, find a champion, find somebody who knows how the system works on the inside, who can guide you to the decision makers. Bring the numbers. I'm not talking about math. I'm talking about people power, which is the ultimate thing that politicians respect. Because politicians every day are thinking about how people are voting, how they're planning to vote, how they're going to vote in the next election. They're thinking about where public opinion is, and they become very astute judges of public opinion. And they know which uh, issues matter to people and which ones don't. So if you want to have an influence on the decision makers, you need to go to where their minds are. You need to bring the people power, which is really easy to say and really hard to do, which is why most people aren't successful in lobbying their government. Communicate. How are you going to build public support if you don't communicate? Talk to the people about the science that you're doing and do it in a way and in a place that the people can understand. Tell your story. Tell a human story that people can relate to. Now, there's a line of thinking in science that says scientists shouldn't be advocates. That's not their role. And as a former politician, I have to tell you, I have a lot of trouble understanding that point of view. Communicate to the public. And finally, remember that all politics is local. You may have heard this expression before, and it is absolutely true. In a very fundamental sense, the only thing that matters to a politician is what's going on back home where their voters are. The voters who sent them to the legislature, to parliament, and that the politician will be looking to, to vote for them again. That is what they are thinking about. So make your science local. Show how it has an impact on those people in that politician's constituency. And I guarantee you, you will have their full attention. Let me tell you a story. Let me finish with a story about politics and science. When I was the finance minister, a medical researcher in Italy announced a treatment for multiple sclerosis, which is a debilitating and potentially a painful disease of the central nervous system. And Canada has the highest rate of prevalence of MS in the world. We don't know why, but we do. And our healthcare systems are run and, and decisions are made by provincial governments. So almost immediately the call went out to provincial governments to fund this new treatment. And there was a lot of pressure 
on my colleague, the Minister of Health. And I remember one day in particular where there was a protest outside of people with MS and their families asking that this new treatment be paid for. And I remember I sat beside the Minister of Health in the legislature and I, I could feel the intense pressure because the people with MS and their families were up in the gallery looking down at us. The opposition was firing questions, demanding to know when this new treatment would be paid for. And all of this was being done in the media spotlight. And, and my colleague, the Minister of Health, was trying to defend the science because this treatment was unproven. We didn't know if it would work or not, if it might even harm some of the people who got the treatment. But it's the very best example I ever saw in my time in politics of a politician going to bat to defend the science, even when it was very difficult. Seven years later, we now know that that theory was wrong and the treatment was wholly ineffective, but we didn't know it back then. Now, there will always be politicians who abuse and misuse the science or who will barrel straight over it if it gets in the way of a decision that they've already made for other reasons. There will always be those politicians. But you scientists out there and around Dalhousie, across the country and around the world, I want you to know that if you have the capacity and the will to build relationships, bring the numbers, tell your story, and make it local, you will be surprised at how impactful you can be and how many politicians there are who are ready to listen and work with you even if it means going against the current. Thank you very much.